So after being attacked by the very defendants she is prosecuting for trying to steal an election from the people of Georgia, District Attorney Fonnie Willis takes the stand to defend her honor, her ethics, and her integrity. Let's talk about that because justice matters. Hey all, Glenn Kirshner here. So friends, first of all, happy Sunday. You know, today I was gonna post part two of my recent interview with Ron Fine. Ron is the legal director of a terrific organization called Free Speech for People, an organization that was created the day after the Supreme Court decided the horrific case of Citizens United, a case that has done significant damage to the fairness of American elections by letting corporations diminish the value of the vote of every American. But instead of posting part two of my interview with Ron, which I will post in the coming days, I have been thinking a lot over the past 48 hours of what is unfolding in that courtroom down in Georgia, in Fulton County where District Attorney Fawny Willis took the stand and addressed the attacks, including the lies that have been leveled against her by Donald Trump and his criminal associates, his co-conspirators, his co-defendants in that criminal scheme to steal the Georgia election from the people. And if you were watching the court proceedings, which thankfully are being televised, you saw District Attorney Willis take the stand, debunk the lies that were put in public court filings by the defendant and then spewed into the public square. You saw her debunk the lies. You saw her defend her honor, her ethics, her integrity. And her testimony inspired lots of headlines. Headlines like the following. This from the New York Times. After testimony in Atlanta, Willis receives both praise and condemnation. From USA Today, Fawny Willis hearing a salacious drama that could undermine Trump election interference case. And how about this from the LA Times? Fawny Willis's inexplicably bad judgment has endangered her case and the nation. There were even headlines written about her father who had to testify to corroborate, to assist in debunking some of the lies that had been told about D.A. Willis, spawning headlines like, Who is John Clifford Floyd III? father of D.A. Fawny Willis. Well, friends, I think the following headline got it exactly right. This from Hugo Lowell of The Guardian. Fawny Willis hearing struggles to dent Trump prosecutors' credibility. Now, friends, frankly, it's not unusual to see different takes, you know, even on the same news event across the various media platforms. But what I'd like to do today on this Sunday with your kind indulgence is bring you my take, my perspective on how things often play out in state court, in local court. Now, if you watch these Justice Matters videos, you might say to yourself, well, wait a minute, Glenn, you're a Fed. You were a Fed for 30 years, a federal prosecutor handling cases in federal court. How is it that you can have an informed opinion about what goes on in state court, which is a fair question. Um, so in Washington, D.C., we have a unique jurisdictional mandate. We have a unique dual responsibility, and it is unlike any other United States attorney's office anywhere in the country or in the territories. There are 93 U.S. attorney's offices, but only one. The U.S. Attorney's Office in the District of Columbia 
has the responsibility to prosecute all federal cases, as do all of the other U.S. attorney's offices, but we're the only ones that also prosecute all local cases. In local court, which is the Superior Court for the District of Columbia. Now stick with me for a minute here, friends. You may ask, how is it that you can be a federal prosecutor and a local prosecutor simultaneously? You know, in most jurisdictions, what we would call a state prosecutor, right? Like down in Fulton County, Georgia, or in Chicago, or Detroit, or Philadelphia, right? In cities where you have a district attorney, you have assistant district attorneys, you have the folks who are the state court prosecutors, and then you have other prosecutors who are federal court prosecutors in those various jurisdictions. How can we be both in D.C.? Well, here's the answer. The District of Columbia is not a state. So unfortunately, I would say inexcusably, the residents of the District of Columbia have no voting voice in Congress. That's what we call taxation without representation. You would have thought we would have done away with that, but no, not in D.C. Hopefully we will someday. So as a result of D.C. not being a state, D.C. doesn't have a district attorney's office. They don't have local prosecutors. So in D.C., the federal prosecutors do the federal prosecutions and the local prosecutions. It is in a very real sense like where federal prosecutors and state district attorneys all at the same time. That is how, you know, I can spend a few years in federal district court in Washington, D.C., prosecuting RICO cases, as I did, and then the next year I can walk across the street to local court, the Superior Court for the District of Columbia, which is nearly identical to the courtroom down in Georgia, in which we see Donald Trump and his criminal associates, his co-defendants, being prosecuted by Fonnie Willis and her team and I can prosecute local cases. That's how I had the opportunity for not just years but decades to prosecute not only RICO cases but murder cases and rape cases and robberies and burglaries and carjackings and arsons and conspiracies and obstruction of justice cases. So hopefully you get the picture that the feds in DC are both the feds and the local prosecutors. So Here's what happens in state court, and I'm going to use that term, state court, to refer to both what's going on in that Fulton County courtroom and what I lived for decades in local court in the District of Columbia. When the evidence against a defendant is strong, indeed irrefutable, you know what the defendants often do? They attack the prosecutors. They try to distract from the strength of the evidence against them by saying, well, the whole, the whole system is rigged. The prosecutors are unethical. They're railroading me. They're bringing charges for some reason other than the evidence, other than the fact that the defendant committed the crime. They attack the prosecutors when the evidence is strong. And that is precisely what Trump and his criminal associates his co-conspirators, his co-defendants down in Georgia, have done against Fawny Willis. And there is a law in Georgia that says if a prosecutor has an actual conflict, well, then that prosecutor could be removed. What is an actual conflict? Well, for example, if Fawny Willis said to herself, you know, Donald Trump and his co-conspirators didn't really do anything wrong. They didn't commit any crimes, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to have the grand jury indict them anyway. That's going to require me to hire special counsel. Then I'm going to hire my boyfriend. Then I'm going to take my boyfriend's salary and use it for my own purposes and my own benefit. That would be bad. That would be unethical. That would be prosecutorial misconduct. That would be a conflict requiring that prosecutor to be removed from the case. So what did Trump and his criminal associates do? They put a whole bunch of information in court filings, including what District Attorney Willis testified under oath were a bunch of lies about her relationship 
with the special counsel, the special prosecutor she brought on to the case as one of several special prosecutors she brought on to the case, Nathan Wade. And they alleged that, oh no, they were boyfriend, girlfriend, and then D.A. Willis brought Wade on just to financially benefit because he would be paid by Georgia in his capacity as a special prosecutor. And you may have seen Fawny Willis, I don't want to say barge into the courtroom, but stride into the courtroom saying, I assume I'm the next witness to testify because Attorney Wade just concluded his testimony. And you saw her take the stand. And you saw her, if you watched the, the proceedings, hold up three defense pleadings that, in her estimation, under oath, she asserted were filled with lies. And think about it. Lies are put in public court filings that are then thrown into the public square and eaten up by Donald Trump's supporters, his base. And friends, if you saw D.A. Willis's testimony, she said under oath, yes, I had a relationship with Attorney Wade for a period of time, but it didn't come into existence until after he was part of the prosecution team, which frankly right there is pretty much the end of the conflict inquiry or allegation by the defense. No, she didn't hire her boyfriend so she could benefit financially. Nevertheless, the defense attorneys kept digging and digging and digging. They said, well, you benefited financially anyway because you two took trips together and sometimes he would put the travel expenses on his credit card. She said, yeah, and then I paid him back for my portion of the travel expenses, and I paid him in cash. The defense attorney said, oh, how can you believe that? We need bank receipts or ATM withdrawal slips. We need proof. She said, you need to understand something. I was taught by my father that I need to keep six months worth of cash of living expenses in a lockbox in my house. So no, I don't necessarily have a withdrawal slip or an ATM receipt showing that, for example, I gave Nathan Wade $2,000 to cover my portion of an expense when we went on a cruise together. And you know, you could almost see the, um, the disbelief, the scorn, mocking even on the face of these defense attorneys. So what happened next? First of all, that was sworn testimony by an elected district attorney. And they didn't seem inclined to believe it. And the next thing you know, Fonnie Willis's father, I think 82 year old father, himself an accomplished civil rights attorney, testified and said under oath, you've got to understand something. And he actually turned to Judge McAfee and said, Your Honor, I, I don't want this to sound racist, but it's a black thing. I taught my daughter that she needed to keep six months worth of cash, living expenses in a lockbox in her home. And if I might, can I tell you what that advice is born of? And then he set out how years ago he was on a fellowship at Harvard and he brought, took his family out to dinner young Fawny at the time and, and Fawny's mother, and he tried to pay the bill for dinner with his American Express card, and the merchant wouldn't accept it. Then he tried to use his Visa card, and the merchant wouldn't accept it. Then he tried to use traveler's checks. Remember traveler's checks back in the day, which were as good as cash, the equivalent of cash, and the merchant wouldn't accept it. Why? Because he was a black man. So he had to pay with $10 in cash. And he actually testified that, yeah, I remember the, the bill was about $9.95 for our meal. And I gave the merchant a $10 bill, which is all that I had. He also testified about what he and his grandchildren, Fonnie Willis's children, experienced as a result of Fawny Willis prosecuting Donald Trump for his crimes, crimes which, mind you, were caught on audio tape when Donald Trump placed a call 
to the Georgia Secretary of State and said, just find me 11,780 votes and declare me the winner. Corruption, abuse, criminal solicitation of election fraud that you hear in Donald Trump's own voice. And when D.A. Willis and her team brought charges against Trump and his criminal associates like Mark Meadows and Rudy Giuliani, Sidney Powell, Jeffrey Clark, Kenneth Chesbro, Jenna Ellis, and the others, instantly they got angry mobs at their home where Fawny Willis and her father lived at the time. Chance involving killing and not only killing Fawny Willis, but her father and her children. Chance of let's burn down her home, death threat after death threat, forcing Fawny Willis to move from her home. That's what she experienced because she decided to try to hold Donald Trump accountable for his crimes, for attempting to steal an, ele steal an election from the people of Georgia. So her father had to testify to support, to bolster, to corroborate what D.A. Willis said about how, yes, she would reimburse Attorney Wade for her share of the travel expenses, and she would do it in cash, just as Attorney Wade had testified. But, you know, these defense attorneys were so dismissive and disbelieving of that, that, yeah, even Fawny Willis's father had to be subjected to testimony. So let me tell you, friends, let me just wrap it up with this. Yes, I worked as a federal prosecutor and a local prosecutor, or what you would think of as a state court prosecutor, simultaneously for decades because of that unique responsibility we federal prosecutors have in the courts of Washington, D.C. And let me tell you, if you've ever been in federal district court in D.C. or any federal courthouse around the country, not that I've been in them all, I've been in several, generally the ceilings are high. The air is pure. Everything happens on time. It's generally a very civil, cordial, even genteel affair. Not always, but generally. Then you go into local court, state court, city court. I don't care if it's Philadelphia, Baltimore, Miami, LA, the Bronx, Brooklyn, and the Superior Court for the District of Columbia, the local court in which I practiced. In that court, every day is a dogfight and a Donnybrook. And I experienced firsthand over and over and over again that when I was prosecuting somebody and the evidence was strong, what did the defense do? They attacked the prosecutor. They attacked the prosecution team. They tried to distract from the evidence by claiming the prosecutors were doing something wrong, unethical, dirty, cruddy. Every day was a dogfight and a Donnybrook. And that's what you saw unfold in that courtroom in Fulton County, Georgia, when Fawny Willis took the stand and testified under oath about the lies the defense had told about her. And there are some who say, as reflected in these headlines that we, we looked at, that huh, Fawny Willis was too loud. She was too brash. She was too aggressive. She was too angry. Are you kidding me? Imagine being a public servant, trying to hold a criminal former president of the United States accountable for trying to steal the election from the people of your state, the people who elected you to protect them and enforce the laws without fear or favor, and then be accused of being too loud, too brash, too aggressive, and too angry when you are exposing the lies that Trump and his criminal associates told about you? No, no. D.A. Willis did exactly what she should do. You know, there is a saying, no good deed goes unpunished. Well, all D.A. Willis was trying to do was enforce the laws of the state of Georgia and look at what she has experienced for it. Not only these lies being told about her, 
And you can debate her judgment in having a relationship with somebody who was on the prosecution team. You can talk about those things, but that's not really what it's about. What it's about is, is there a disqualifying conflict? And the answer, based on the evidence, is no. I understand the hearing isn't over yet, and I was gonna wait until the hearing concluded, so we had all of the evidence available, but I will update and do another, you know, Justice Matters unfiltered video as soon as the, um, the hearing concludes, and certainly when Judge McAfee issues his ruling, which I'm fairly confident will be, no, DA Willis is not disqualified, her team is not disqualified, her office is not disqualified, but I think D.A. Willis met the force of the BS that was thrown into the mix by Donald Trump and his criminal associates. And that's life in state court. That was life in D.C. Superior Court for me for decades. And, you know, I welcomed it. If you don't want to engage in the rough and tumble of state court, of local court, well, then maybe you need not be a prosecutor, a public servant who chooses to prosecute in those courts. But D.A. Willis chose to prosecute in Fulton County Court in Georgia. And I, for one, applaud her testimony. And I would expect her to be loud and aggressive and forceful and even angry at what she has had to endure, not only the lies, but the death threats and being driven from her home simply for trying to hold Donald Trump accountable for his crimes. So friends, thank you for bearing with me through that rant. I very much look forward to Judge McAfee's ruling, which you've heard me say before, I'm not a betting man. I'm not a high roller. You know, one dollar is my betting limit. You know, I, I would put the full buck, at least based on the evidence we've seen thus far, I would put the full buck on Judge McAfee denying the defense motion to disqualify Fawny Willis. Because justice matters. Friends, as always, please stay safe, please stay tuned, and I look forward to talking with you all again tomorrow.